Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Uh, we really appreciate your presence and everything, uh, all the feedback we've been getting. Today, we're going to be talking about subtle advertising uh, with me, Ruth Del Pino, and Amy Argirio. Um, we are going to be introducing ourselves. So, hello, everyone. I think you know me by now, but my name is Rita Pino. I'm a prevention educator for the Mercer Council on Alcoholism and Drug Addiction. I am the Mercer County Coordinator. I have a Bachelor of Arts in Global Studies, Political Science, and American Studies. I'm certified in teaching English as a foreign language, life skills training, and leadership. All right, Amy. Hi, I'm Amy Argirio. I also work at the Mercer Council. I'm a program coordinator, and I facilitate the Boppins Life Skills um, Training program and I work with the middle school, 6th, 7th, and 8th graders. I am also a certified K-6 to teacher. Okay, I love it. Okay, so, um, right, introduction. I don't know what happened. Give me a second, my apologies. Okay, they're going to present from here. So we have a video that we're going to share um, and I would like to sort of have Amy preface with uh, the video that we're going to share. So this is a video, <clears throat> whose ad are you? And I love showing this with my students to give them the idea of that they're walking advertisements for so many different companies and products. And I don't think students or children, teenagers even realize that they are a walking advertisement and they see, um, four to 600 ads a day um, on, on social media now, the computer, TV, anywhere they go, there's, they're just inundated with ads. And I just thought this video was so appropriate to, um, to, for children to say that they are walking advertisement and what they, what they um, take in, all the ads that they take in. Okay, here we go. You can tell it's a little older <laughs> Yeah. for the TV. Wow, I really like that video for a lot of different reasons, but I think the best reason is that we sort of find um, that I sort of pointed out that it seems like it's from the 90s, but yeah. it's also, can you imagine what today's uh, advertising is, right? So there's a lot of stuff going on there as well. Um, so yeah, that's, that's really powerful stuff. Um, so we're going to be talking about common advertising techniques. This is something that we actually uh, teach in life skills training. Uh, but Amy's going to sort of go over some of the big ones, and then we're going to sort of talk about them as we go. So the common advertising te techniques you'll see um, I have listed are like celebrity endorsements, popular bandwagon appeal, romance, maturity, fun, relaxation, voice of authority, experts, the comparison, the demonstration, opinions, and then the deal, like the two for one, um, the deal appeal. When advertisers are targeting teens, they usually stick to the top four. They'll stick with um, celebrity endorsements. They'll go with like a popular appeal, bandwagon appeal, everybody's doing it. So they'll show advertisers with 
young kids all doing the same thing. They'll go right to the uh, romance and the maturity, um, the sex appeal, and then just the fun and the relaxation um, appeal. <laughs> um, and that's who they, that's the four techniques they use for um, the teens, to go after the teens. They, you'll see they'll try to do the deal, the two for one or comparisons, but teens seem to look more for the fun, the bright colors, the cele celebrities are, um, are big with the, with the teens that they go after. So I really like that you're pointing out that the first four advertisement techniques are the ones that are used for teens. Because I sort of, I definitely agree with this, but also I sort of like the psychology behind it that the celebrity endorsements, the popularity, the romance, and the fun sort of is seen as something that's childlike because people who are older see it as something people that are younger do. But at the same time, people who are younger see it as something that people who are older do. So right. this is, there's this sort of weird juxtaposition where they see it as something that they're, they're embracing that's older, that's coveted, that's, you know, sort of forbidden in a lot of senses. But then you also have a lot of, you know, adults saying, that's for children. We don't usually, you know, give into something like that, or we're more, we're more in tune with saying no to something like that. Right, right. So I just find that really interesting. Um, so this is also interesting, Amy. You want to talk about this? Yes. Yeah, so I came up with, I found three as I thought we could just discuss um, using the techniques that the advertisers use. Now, the first one is um, the product is Coca-Cola and they're using Steve, Har Steve Harvey. And I mean, he's everybody's, everybody loves Steve Harvey. You think of his name and you just start smiling. He's popular. He's a celebrity. He's likable. So, hey, if he's drinking a Coke, then I'm going to drink a Coke because it's just, it's appealing. And Coca-Cola is harmless, you know, for most people. It's, you know, if you're not into the sugar intake and, and all that, but it's, that's more of a harmless product. And Steve Harvey is just very much appealing. So he hits off the popular, the celebrity, likable, fun. He's fun. Um, the next ad is, it's Game Boy. It's game day. I'm sorry. It's game day. And you have two Heineken bottles. And with the Heineken bottles is a game controller for PS4 or Xbox. We know Heineken is geared for 21 and older. It's an alcoholic beverage. But it's interesting that they paired it with a, game, um, a PS4 or an Xbox, a game system. Who, t who normally is playing the game system? Young boys teenagers, younger ones. So it's interesting how they're targeting, so to speak, 21 year olds, but are they just targeting 21 year olds? Or are they going down lower and targeting young boys um, under the age of 21? Because that's who we know is are playing these game systems. Um, the same with the Jewel ad. That's a fun ad. That's, you know, bright colors. Look, they're young. The models they're using are young. They're, they look, you know, they're pretty, they're handsome. They have a cup in their hand, which the cup can, you know, be like a party cup. It's not red solo, but it gives you that idea of a party cup and a little red straw in the one cup um, signifies a bar drink. Not so much, you know, how many teenagers drink out of a little skinny red straw. That ad is the Jewel products. Again, we know is for 21 year olders, 21 year olds and higher. Juul was supposed to be a product used to get people to stop smoking. This ad to me doesn't show like it's an ad to get young people to stop smoking. It to me shows like, hey, we're having fun. This is popular. Look at us. We're, you know, young, popular. Join us. We're smoking. We're drinking. Um, what is the real purpose behind this ad? The subtle inferences in this ad. And they're targeting, they're supposed to be targeting older and who's really paying attention in this ad? Under 21, young kids. <laughs> That's so interesting. Um, and you know, a lot of people talk about how vaping and e-cigarettes were really meant for, for a cessation tool. Um, in the UK, they sort of implemented it in some of their um, government funded programs to see if it would work in the mid 2000s. Um, but those were a different kind. And Juul sort of has, you know, uh, packaged and primed this sort of box that 
teenagers can sort of fit themselves in. And I just find that so interesting because they can say, well, I mean, our product is meant for 21 year olds and older, but at the same time, there's just this sort of implication that even though there's been more regulation on Juul advertising to teens, there is a definite market for teenagers to use Juul. Even there, you can see that these people may be 21 or older, who knows, but they still look very young and they look like they're having fun and that they're right. drinking. So there's a legal issue there in, in some ways where there's a sort of weird gray area where they can cover their own, you know, loss, losses and assets and things like that. But at the same time, people are still concerned with the amount of advertising meant for teenagers, even though it's meant for 21 year olds. Right. It's very interesting when you start looking at ads and question, well, who are you really targeting here? As an adult, we can see it, but young kids aren't seeing it the same way we are seeing it. And there is a subtle implication in some of these ads that are really targeting the younger, the younger ones. Um, the next slide is actually, I wanted to talk about the um, Juul Vaporized campaign. And Juul did start out, that was e-cigarettes, not so much Juul, but e-cigarettes did originate with, hey, this is a product that can get you to stop smoking, which is great. That's all we want. We want people to stop smoking. And the idea was fantastic. Juul comes along and they take on the old big tobacco um, campaign and they look at a way, well, how can we make more money? They came up with the Juul's Vaporize campaign and they actually targeted teens. Now, if it is a you if it is a device for, to stop you from smoking, you can see in the chart next to it, over the years, the decline in teen smoking cigarettes has dramatically come down. And the prevention um, education is really working. Uh, you won't hear too many teens promoting smoking cigarettes. They're disgusted with cigarettes. It's gross to them. It's it's horrific. But if you notice the red line, vaping is going through the roof. Vaping is on the rise and kids think it's cool. It's okay to vape. It's not, it's not nicotine. It's not tobacco. Um, it's not harmful. The Juul Vaporize campaign came in and they specifically targeted teenagers. They held launch parties where at the launch parties, they would have 1500 samples and they would have the teens sample them and get their opinion on them. And then they asked the teens to take selfies promoting these samples and put it on your social media campaign. They targeted, um, they went after like Miley Cyrus and Katy Perry. They went to celebrities who appeal, directly appeal to teenagers and got them to use their product. Um, and they, they advertised on Nickelodeon. They advertised in Seventeen Magazine. Wow. They advertised on the Cartoon Network. Seventeen Magazine, you know, I have fond memories of that magazine. When I was in high school, 15, 16, 17, you know, you got that every month, you were excited. When you turn 21, you're not reading 17 anymore. You've moved on to Cosmo. You're now Cosmo girl. Jewels are 21 and older. So why are they advertising in a 17 magazine? They're, you know, you're under the age of 21. You're not legally able to purchase or use a jewel but they went into certain magazines and literally targeted teenagers. Um, they use bright, colorful ads, fun ads, um, you know, dancing, smiling, drinking, just showing that, hey, this is just so much fun. Like if you wanna have fun, smoke a jewel. What happened at, at one point, um, a group of parents in Massachusetts got together and the prosecutor and they formed a civil action lawsuit when young teenagers were getting sick and they noticed this, the high number of teenagers utilizing this product tool. So they started a civil action lawsuit and it caught the attention. And then throughout the nation, they started to regulate Jewel. They started investigating and they got themselves into somewhat trouble <clears throat> and they've had to change their campaign. They've now gone back to 35 and older. They're now targeting 35 and older, and they're going back to their original thought of, if you want to quit smoking, try a Juul product that will take, they're not now targeting the young generation, but the damage is done. It's already been out there. They, 
the time that they used focusing on this campaign, they created the damage. I just find it so interesting looking at the trends right there. And you can see there's a really small window. That's like only three years. Three years. Of advertising. And you can see like the use has gone straight up. So, straight up. I mean, can you imagine like, it only takes three years. It only takes not even a whole generation mm -mm. for that sort of thinking and that sort of acceptance of a product to happen. You know, that's really good advertising. And when I look at these, I don't know if anyone's old enough. Um, I may be just like, you know, shooting in the dark here. But I remember when the iPod first came out, they used to have um, uh, uh, commercials where people would dance to the iPad with their the iPod with their headphones in and mm -hmm. it would be their silhouettes yeah. and a colorful background. This sort of reminds me of that because they just look fun. They look like fun. they're having a good time. And when you have those people that are utilizing these companies, one, they make money by advertising their products, but two, I don't know about you, but free is usually for me. So if I have something right. free, I'm like, all right, why not? I'll try it. So right. I just can't imagine my brain thinking that. And then a, a teenager's brain coming to that same conclusion. They want really, to fit in. All their friends are yeah. using it. So we need to fit in and, and try it. And the and was also um, campaign that there was no nicotine or very low nicotine. You couldn't get addicted to it. Well, that has been proven false. And fortunately, that came out sooner than later, um, where there still is traces of nicotine in even the nicotine-free products. They say they're nicotine-free, but they can still find traces of nicotine in some of those products. The flavors were big that, you know, they targeted cotton candy and mango. Adults aren't going to go after a cotton candy flavor. Teenagers are. And fortunately, they have now removed the flavoring um, devices off of the shelves and can no longer sell those. Um, the FDA stepped in also and said that, no, we can't approve that. You know, it's definitely geared for the, for the younger generation. But there yeah, has, yeah. you know, I think when those illnesses started with the breathing issues and the lung issues was an eye-opening moment. And that's when they realized the dangers of this product and what they were getting away with. Yeah. So fortunately, I think that's why it's only three years because the dangers came out much quicker than say with cigarette smoking. That took decades before they knew the dangers of smoking. Yeah, I, I think that there's a lot to be said about that. And uh, we will be discussing that in another uh, webinar with Melissa Arnold, who is the tobacco specialist. So she'll be really getting into a lot of some of the questions that a lot of parents and you know people who are working with kids have about what kind of you know things are these children facing when they sort of seem at the whim of these big tobacco companies. So right. I find that really interesting too. Um, so next thing is more advertising. This is crazy. Yep, yep. just like different advertising. You know, there's Pitbull. Everybody loves Pitbull. Teenagers love Pitbull. And he's advertising Bud Light, making it look fun. And you know, teenagers, oh, if Pitbull's drinking, we got to drink Bud Light. And and the Corona, why would you put Corona with Elmo? Like, what is the reasoning showing Elmo and a Corona, a Corona bottle? And the one that really gets me is the two little um, advertisements, the one, the Lorax, and then right next to it, the Ultra bottle. Why pair those two? Why do those two have to be seen next to each other? They could have been set separately or a different pairing of but a children's movie next to an alcoholic beverage. The That's subtle, so interesting. The subtle advertisement, the subtle, you know, you have to be very careful of and watch for. So I just find it interesting that, you know, a lot of the time kids are made aware more of this stuff. It's not as if they say no to it all the time, but because they are made more aware of it, you sort of see the target market shifting and the ways in which people are advertising sort of shift. So I don't, I don't know, I guess I'm asking the question, what changed? What made advertisers so ready to really hone in on the teenagers market? Like what's the reasoning behind this, you know? Um, so I just find that really interesting and we will be discussing that uh, very soon. So, you know, we're gonna be going through the waves of uh, a lot of these questions people may have. 
So uh, this is actually sort of me answering my own question. Um, we're talking about target market. And uh, uh, as Amy was alluding to before, Seventeen Magazine is usually only read by people or girls in high school. There's no, like I wasn't 21 reading a magazine, you know, uh, telling me what my future boyfriend's name is going to be. That's not really something that I found amusing at that certain point. I was more interested in other things. And they are teen-oriented magazines online and uh, in person. And in 2009, the American Association of Pediatrics <laughs> actually did a study. And these teen-oriented magazines contained, get ready now, so these teen, mag teen magazines contained 48% more advertising for beer, 20% more advertising for hard liquor, and 92% more advertising for sweet alcoholic drinks than aimed at adults of legal age, drinking age. So I actually have the study right here for anyone that wants to look at it. It's really long and convoluted, but I just sort of pulled out some of the things that I thought were really relevant and interesting. But I, I think that even as, as it is in 2009, this is something that was now 12 years ago and it's still relevant today um, as the target market has sort of shifted towards finding specific groups to advertise for instead of just throwing it out there, slapping it on a wall and see who, response to it, we've really, and advertisers have really found a way to sort of niche and sort of put their claws into something that makes it so much more relevant for the people it's aimed at. So if you have a 17 year old looking at a beer, you know, they're thinking, oh, you know, there's a party this weekend, maybe I can just have one Heineken, you know, so there's just this sort of subtle advertising that sort of enters the psyche of these teenagers that are reading these magazines, and that's how they make a sell. Um, also, there is something here that says nearly $4 billion is spent annually on prescription drug advertising. I have a jewel uh, e-cigarette marketing uh, um, uh, sort of ad underneath. But before we sort of talk about that, this advertisement, um, this number also came from the AAP study. And they did a sort of a thing where they uh, surveyed 3,500 South Dakota students. So these are just students that are 9 to 10 years old. And nine to 10 year olds, 75% of the fourth graders and nearly 90% of ninth graders, which is the other part, recognized Budweiser and their separate ads. So they had a couple ads dealing with a frog, then a couple ads dealing with a ferret. So why do frogs and ferrets need to be part of a Budweiser ad when frogs and ferrets usually aren't meant to advertise to adults? And that's sort of the question a lot of people would be asking. Also, many studies have revealed that exposure to alcohol advertising results in more positive beliefs about drinking and is predictive of drinking during early adolescence and young adulthood. So a lot more people that are either surrounded by drinking, that either see a lot of alcohol advertisements, who see a lot of drug and uh, alcohol sort of use around them in any sort of way, um, that is prevalent and persistent and keeps happening, they are more likely to drink and more likely to say, well, it's just a beer. Well, it's just two beers. Well, it's just two shots of vodka. You know, so there's just sort of a lot of justification that happens in their thought process. Also, drug companies now spend more than twice as much money on marketing as they do on research and development. That's not necessarily a surprise. And studies have revealed that marketing efforts do pay off because doctors are now finding that 92% of patients who are requesting a, a drug happen to request an advertised drug. So that's obviously dealing with adults, but that's still relevant to children today because they sort of see, um, they see these advertisements as well. And in the future, they may have that advertisement in mind for their specific body and their ailments that they are considering with a doctor. So I just think that those things and these numbers are shocking, yes, but that's also in 2009. Can we imagine what's going to be happening later on? You know, um, and I think that a lot of people also understand that customers in general, when they have their age, their interests, their income levels, their socioeconomic, uh, like just in general situation, these are all things that are considered for target markets. And we'll, we're sort of going to get into some more of that later. But when people, when, market, when marketers are looking for targets and looking for customers, everyone has a sort of buy-in when it comes to what they want and what they consider good for them. Because each person at a different age and at a different stage in their life wants different things. And target marketers realize this. And that's kind of concerning in a lot of ways. It's good and bad. So...
We'll be moving on. If anybody has any questions, obviously we're gonna be sharing these slides, uh, but we do have resources at the end of the presentation as well, in case anybody wants to refer to these things on their own everyday basis. So we are, I don't know why this video is not showing up on here, but we will go to here. And um, uh, Amy, do you wanna talk about this ad before we actually play it? This is just another um, awesome video that shows the effects of advertisement um, that they have. They, they show you all the wonderful things. Obviously, that's what advertisements are for, to sell their product. But they always neglect to show you the consequences to some of these products um, to make you stop and think about this product. Yes, we know the whole purpose is to buy their product, but there are negative effects also to buying the products and they neglect to show it. And this, this is just a perfect video that shows um, the effects of advertising. That's such a powerful ad. I always like it when I get yeah. to see that. So um, you're right. And I think that there are definitely um, things that we have that we as a society need to work on. Um, and there are advertisements that exist um, that affect our everyday lives and when we're children. And then we grow into adulthood and we still have the same types of buying habits. Mm -hmm. um, so I just find that really interesting that, you know, 
it can really affect our psyche and the way that we see ourselves. I love the end of that video when it shows the model for the bull, uh, for the billboard yes. and how her before and then all the work that went into her and not just the physical work, they had to do digital work too, you know, to make the eyes bigger, the, the nose smaller, all that effort that went into the final product, which did not look like the original to begin with. And there was nothing wrong with the original. And they had to do all that work that showed, you know, is that the truth behind that product that they were trying to sell? Yeah. I think that's really uh, interesting. And that really does play into the, what is called technically like traditional advertising in its mm -hmm. own right, even though it's not traditional because that's not how things used to be, but it's how things used to be for me. And now it's, this is how things are for children that are children right now. So it's just, it, it evolves, right? And we're gonna be talking about how advertising has changed in the past years. Um, and I will sort of touch on some things that are really interesting, but also something that are clever, but it's not like we didn't see them coming. You know, um, you sort of just say, they wouldn't cross that line. There's no way they would do that. And you're right. like, well, I guess they did, you know? Right. Um, so it, there's, there's moments where you're just like, no, there's no way advertising could go that deep or that subliminal. And then you're like, oh, it can. There are and definite moments where that happens. Yeah. And it does. Yeah. And it's, it's a little scary, but we're going to be talking about it just to, you know, uh, get it on the open and to sort of flesh through some of these ideas. Um, so lifestyle advertising seems to be more common and in many ways can present as more dangerous. Um, there are several different areas that we can look at, but social media partners can be big individual, can be individual influencers with big impressionable audiences. So if you're sort of talking about this, and as I'm reading this, I'm sort of just saying, when you have people who look and you have children that look at people online that look at people on youtube instagram face not so much facebook sorry that's a little older um instagram TikTok, discord uh, twitch all these sorts of social medias that influence uh, children and connect them to people they wouldn't otherwise some of these people that become really big that have a lot of followers that have a lot of attention they can technically be considered something that's a free friend. And I'm gonna be talking about this concept a little bit later, uh, actually, I think in the next slide. But um, social media sort of gives influence to what are technically lifestyle influencers. And what I mean by this is lifestyle influencers are just influencers that exist, that live their life and blog about it or live their life and talk about it. So they travel and they're like, oh, I'm traveling. Come along with me. So that sort of introspection and that sort of like following them along, getting an inside look on somebody else's life that seems to be so popular is really interesting to a lot of people and in a lot of different ways. So when we sort of look at um, these sorts of social media partners with individual influencers, we look at the form of sponsorships and endorsements from lifestyle influencers. And I'm going to be touching upon that um, in a couple of minutes, but First, what is a lifestyle influencer? Amy, do you want to sort of guess? A lifestyle influencer? Yeah. Just um, somebody who goes on their social media platform and just discusses their lifestyle, what their, I don't want to say needs, um, their lifestyle is like and what, what they think is a happy lifestyle. Yeah, really, it's, it's, it's really much that. Yeah. Um, and lifestyle influencers, even to narrow that down a little bit more, are sort of like living through example for people that follow them. And um, I think this can be good and it can also be dangerous. If you have people that you follow that are really good at, you know, um, living a healthy lifestyle, that are good at just being good people, there's not really, a, you're not really running a risk there. But technically, if you follow a lifestyle influencer that doesn't um, have something good, then it sort of influence, it can influence you in different ways. So we're going to sort of be um, looking at some of this, uh, like there are some articles here about how the ad industry is changing. Um, it just sort of talks about how uh, there's an evolution to advertisements and how it switched from just regular traditional um, internet traffic to very subliminal purchasing identities that we would talk about on the next slide as well. They were talking about a lot of studies about how people 
are now using platforms and lifestyle influencers to have personalized ads for these people that are on these social medias. So let's say I have a TikTok and somebody else has a TikTok. We will not get the same advertisement, even though we're on the same platform in the same area, because we have different interests. So I'll probably get something about lipstick or makeup or something because I really enjoy that. But my friend sitting next to me could get something about hiking gear. So there's a lot of different personalized advertisements that happen on these social media specifically. And we sort of saw that coming, but what we really didn't see coming and what this sort of talks about, um, you can click on that if you feel the need to, is that you now have particular brands that match with media influencers that are very subliminal, that almost seem just like a regular everyday sort of thing, right? So as you can see, this is just a person saying, oh, I'm at the, or I'm at the, I'm next to water today, really enjoying, you know, just my time off. And as you can see, that's an alcohol, but we don't necessarily know what type of alcohol brand it is, but it could be somewhere in the hashtags. It could be on the site, Sublimity with the advertisement somewhere. Um, there's also another one where uh, this person was like, yeah, out on the town, living my life, Amsterdam vodka. And they're talking about um, just going out tonight and here's what we're going to have. And this person was sponsored by Amsterdam Vodka. There is another um, advertisement that I'm going to show where this person matched, I believe it was this one and another one, where they actually, um, it was a Netherlands braced brewer Heineken, uh, where part, then they partnered with top men's influencers, where they sort of did a lot of different things, clothing designers, boutiques to create a line of branded menswear. Um, and they, they did like small advertisements with pictures of selfies and these people in these fashion clothes that Heineken sponsored for them to just, you know, look cool and look interesting. But these are people that are influencers that partnered with Heineken for them to advertise their clothing brand because now Heineken makes clothes. Um, so this person here actually did a, uh, a sort of photo shoot with Heineken's clothes right here. And as you can see, menswear style preference hashtag Heineken. So that is really interesting. This person here also did an advertisement or an endorsement by a local brewery uh, called Bex, I believe it is. Maybe that's just the brand, but this person just like, hey, living my best life, cheers friends. And then they're talking about Beck, which is a brewery brand. And they were just, it's just them living their life, but also them drinking something from this particular brewery. And um, that is something that we can all sort of realize that it's not just billboards anymore, mm -hmm. it's everywhere. And this subliminal, you know, sort of advertising exists in every face of every screen. Um, so it's not as if they've changed their techniques in necessarily, but they sort of have, they sort of upped their game on getting their, uh, getting their stuff across. So I just thought that was interesting to share. Um, next, we are going to be talking about how does advertising change in the past years? Well, we sort of we sort of uh, discussed this um, and the rise of social media gives something called purchasing identity. Now purchasing identity is just, I like this, therefore advertisers will give me something for this product. I don't know if anyone's ever sort of felt this way, but when you're looking for something once on the internet and all of a sudden you get ads for it constantly, it's either if you're trying to watch a YouTube video on something specific and you get an ad for the thing you looked for. For me, for example, I was looking at uh, filters because um, I need a new filter for my purifier. And I ended up getting ads for a filter for like a month because I clicked on one thing. And that's because these, uh, these platforms that you sign on to, you give permission for them to purchase parts of your identity and then sell it back to you. Um, this means whatever like you have, whatever follow you have on social media, these companies are persistent in getting you to buy their products and they will do that. Now, the interesting thing about Generation Z is that they really don't care um, because they grew up in a time with advertising, because they grew up in a time where their privacy is constantly violated by cookies for, you know, social media to be free. They sort of sign up for that and realize that that's just part of the game. That's just something that happens. Um, I also did want to talk about um, 
that children may be isolated a lot of times. Um, so they're going to be going to streaming websites. They're going to be going to Instagram followers more. They're going to be going to TikTok followers more because they are more isolated. They don't have access as much to their friends these days. So they are going to be turning more towards influencers for them to have what I call the free friend. And because these people are lifestyle influencers, because they open up their identities for you to see and for you to see parts of their life, then they can be considered a friend because you know a lot about them. Obviously, it's a one-way friendship, but it is something that does exist. Um, now, there are small, easy ways of being exposed to influencers who they already like and then liking what the influencers like. And this is how advertising has really changed. Um, for example, uh, you have someone who I believe, uh, Pootie Pie, he is the most uh, YouTube he, is the, he has the most subscribers on YouTube, and he did a shout out to one small YouTube channel, and that YouTube channel gained a million uh, subscribers the next day. So there's these people that have these words that have a lot of influence, and they sort of use that to, you know, just live their life, do what they want, you know, advertise to whatever. And then we're going to be talking about some of the TikTok followers, especially because TikTok is the new thing, and it has the most uh, influence on Gen Z right now. Um, you know, you have here people being free friends, for example, you have Charlie D'Amillo um, has been seen vaping in her TikTok. Zoe Laverne is 19 with a scandal um, about kissing a 13 year old. Tony Lopez, who's 21, has been accused of sexual battery. And these are all TikTokers. These are all people that have a huge following that not only influence what sort of products you buy, but they also influence what you can act like in public. Um, and I think that's really concerning. And I sort of wanted to put out here, like, if you're going to have idols, get better idols and make sure that you, you are following the right people and making sure that you are having those sorts of conversations um, with as many people as possible about how you're being influenced. And Amy, I sort of wanted to put this to you because I said, I put this here the first time and you were like, well, should we have idols in the first place? Do you right. want to talk about that? Right. I said, well, maybe we shouldn't have idols to begin with. You should focus on yourself <clears throat> and your family and not worry about idolizing somebody other than you worry about yourself. We shouldn't, I, I feel like, and I said it to my own children, don't look at somebody else's life and idolize it because you don't know the truth about their life. You only see what they're showing you and focus on how are you going to make your life better with what your likes are what your values are, what your morals are, and what do you want out of life? That's all that you should be focusing on, not looking at somebody else's life and say, I want that life, because you'll always be disappointed. Yeah. Thanks for that, Amy. I, I always think about that, you know, whenever I look at this now, I'm just like, well, I guess you're right. I don't really have any idols in my life, but like, I, I can see where that comes from, you know? where yeah. our purchasing identities sort of give us room to look at idols and have those sorts of feelings towards wanting to be like that person. So right. uh, we're also uh, going to be talking about trends. Um, I won't be playing this YouTube video just for the sake of the content itself because there are quite a few F-bombs in it, but um, this is a trend on TikTok videos called Where Is My Jewel? And this person, it's actually a song and basically the trend is that this person asks someone where's their jewel and they get increasingly mad when they don't find out where it is. And it becomes slightly disturbing where you have someone, um, a lot of people use this as a backdrop for whatever video they're using. So it's just a song and they do whatever to it. So once it hits the uh, pinnacle of um, the song, then uh, the like the the plot twist happens. So a lot of people do makeup to the song actually, and they'll do small makeup, you know, whatever. And then as soon as the song hits the pinnacle or the climax, they'll reveal that they have a full face of really good makeup. So it's like weird because it's a song that talks about vaping and a person getting angry about not finding their jewel, but they also use it as a soundtrack to do other videos. So in its own right, it's very subliminal because you're thinking, now you have jewel on your mind, regardless of whether or not you are in it for the makeup videos or you're in it for the cooking videos. Now you have this particular song that can be the backdrop for anything or any trend that you're doing. And I find that slightly disturbing where 
you know, you could be doing makeup and all of a sudden jewels on your mind. Like you didn't sign up for that, but that's what happened, you know? Um, so I find that really interesting. There's also, um, what can you do with your vaping smoke? As early as the 2010s, Vine and TikTok really did highlight these trends where they actually had vaping contests. And these people would use the vaping uh, smoke or the vapor, um, it's, just, it's smoke, it's not vapor, sorry. Uh, the smoke where they would um, make shapes with the smoke. And I just, you don't think of these things. Like this is something that happens with, with the new trends coming out. This is something that happened while I was growing up. And I didn't really think about that, but yeah, it happens. And Vine and TikTok had a huge part in making uh, vaping contests and vaping something that is real. Um, there's also FOMO, which is fear of missing out, which is a trend on social media that's been there for a while. Really, this is just sort of peer pressure getting in the way of a lot of things like, oh no, I'm not gonna be at the party. You know, what are people gonna think of me kind of thing. Um, at Columbia University, I just wanted to put this in here, a study on on the, from the National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse. Um, did a study uh, about just in general that people who use social media are five times more likely to buy cigarettes, three times more likely to drink, and two times as likely to use marijuana. Um, additionally, adolescents are not who are not only exposed to celebrities and influencers engaging in this behavior, but also their friends and family are more likely to do these things as well, and are more likely to also um, engage in behavior that normalizes and glamorizes, glamorizes my apologies, uh, illicit behavior with prescription drug use and binge drinking, uh, making teens think that it's more appropriate to do so. So that is also a little bit disturbing, but that is something that is very real and something that, um, you know, uh, social media sort of has the, uh, the reins on that one where it can influence a lot of uh, people's time and money and where they put their energy. So, um, all right. So uh, there's a lot of stuff uh, that we can talk about advertising and money, but I just sort of want to break it down a little bit on how we said before, Amy, what was the number um, that a company spent on teenagers per year? Uh, for advertising, I believe it was like one something, maybe two billion. The video that we it's just on showed. the higher end, I think closer to two billion. Okay, so um, companies make contracts and create cookies and collect data for them, and this is how we sort of get clicks that um, that uh, make money for these companies. But something that we really are looking at, and this is another study by the American Association of Pediatrics, they are on a roll with these sorts of things, but they really are talking about the subliminal messaging and the money that influences, uh, you know, all of this stuff. Um, uh, these companies will spend $25 billion per year on uh, basically advertising, um, drugs and alcohol and uh and things like that which there i didn't find numbers for teenagers because it was a little harder to break it down but from that 25 billion i can't imagine how much of that is actually for teenagers if it's anything more than 2 billion that's concerning you know um so we're there's still definitely a shift in trying to advertise to, uh, to teenagers, but also there are some things that we have, uh, I call it unavoidable advertising. And this unavoidable advertising happens a lot in communities of color, um, especially urban areas where they are surrounded a lot more by um, alcohol, drugs, and tobacco and things like that for advertisements. I mean, I know driving through Trenton, you can find an alcohol, I mean, um, uh, uh, some place that sells alcohol and tobacco on almost every street every corner. corner there's definitely something there and that is something to be addressed. And uh, there are many advertisements for communities of color that are more likely to witness the effects of drugs with illicit and uh, illicit, explicit and implicit advertising. Um, money has been spent a lot on these different areas, but it is something that I think is dispersed and allocated so that they get the easiest win. Um, and to put it, uh, more in a way that people may understand is that companies invest in things that they know is going to profit. 
So if they know that in communities of color, in urban cities, where a lot of people have a lot of foot traffic, there's going to be more advertisements there because they're just going to be more eyes to see it. They're going to be more feet that walk past these advertisements. So it's, it's something that uh, definitely um, is concerning, but also something that makes a lot of sense for advertisers to do. And it's not right, but it is something that happens on an everyday basis. Um, so there are also uh, more, there's been more money uh, spent on funding and advertising on drugs than it is to actually convince children not to do the drugs. But that's a whole nother conversation that we will not touch right now. So, um, and all of that too, how has the game changed for how teenagers and advertising companies spend money? Um, that is a lot of things, but mostly, and this is the important part, teenagers usually don't make their own money, which means parents are in charge of that money, which means adults give them access to that sort of money. So I'm not saying that we should technically control every part of our child's money and not giving them any autonomy, but also making sure and following up with the sorts of things they're spending their money on, because that is a truly important part of uh, understanding their purchasing identity and making sure they're buying the right things for themselves and for their bodies. Anything to add to that, Amy? No, I like that um, as a parent, you should follow up on your teenagers purchasing um, and having conversations with them, asking them, well, why is it you wanna purchase you know, those $300 sneakers that you don't really have the money for, you want me to buy you for what purpose and, you know, what value of it. And just having conversations, you know, pointing out, well, how much, how many other pairs of sneakers can you buy for $300? Are you falling into that advertising game that they're playing with you? Um, the whole technique of why do you have to have those specific sneakers? The, the, what did they, they had it, the, um, the sneaker, it's like a sneaker thing. Uh, my son went through it. And when he started working, he, you know, started paying for his own sneakers, his $250. And he quickly learned, I don't really want to spend all my money on one pair of sneakers. So it's constantly having a conversation and, you know, talking with your, your child about what is the purpose of that? you know, are you falling into their little ploy? Yeah, that's so interesting, right? And I also think that when you sort of talk about how they spend their money, it's also a conversation to open up sort of the peer pressure they may feel when it comes to, you know, any sort of things that they feel they should be doing rather than actually should be doing. Um, right, because so everybody's doing it. Yeah, yeah, just because everybody's doing it doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. Yeah, definitely. So that sort of uh, translates into our next slide saying, what can you do? Uh, you know, and we just sort of list practical things, you know, always talk to your kids, limit their screen time as much as you can. I know this isn't always practical for some people, considering they may have teenagers or people or teenagers with jobs that may need their cell phone for more than a, a elongated period of time. And I actually have something here that's a router that can change the times on your child's device and it can sort of limit the sites that they go on if you want to do so. Um, I actually use this for my, uh, my girls. Uh, they are 12 and 10. So we're sort of at that age where they're still learning how to responsibly have a phone, how to responsibly have a laptop and things like that. So this really does teach them um, how to block uh, or how you can block and filter any sort of content they're looking at and make sure they're getting good amounts of sleep uh, because you can turn off the Wi-Fi and their uh, devices at a certain time. Um, and it's all controlled by your phone, so you can turn it on or off whenever you want. Um, it happens to run around $200 for you to install it and to keep it. And there's no fees after that. You just have to pay for the Wi-Fi service. But in general, it has saved us a lot of conversations about responsible cell phone use because they just sort of get used to the habits of using their devices in a timely manner and having spaces for times to use it and time to sleep and time to be with the family. So it sort of breaks up that, um, that you know, like the, the sort of uncomfortableness that you may have and also having those conversations 
while you're turning off those devices is truly important. Mm -hmm. Also, finding commonalities with them. You know, maybe you both really love to, you know, do murder mystery boxes together, like Amy was talking about earlier um, with me. Or you like to paint with your with your kids. I love painting with my nieces. It's something we love to do together. We also love uh, baking together. That's really something that we have in common. Um, we, I love finding ways to spend more time with them. Like earlier today, I was out in the snow because uh, it just snowed with my nieces. Accept them holistically in any form, whatever they're in. Um, and that means in every aspect, whether it's their grades and whether or not they're actually doing well, helping with them, them with that aspect, whether or not it's their gender or sexuality, whether or not it's their identity as a human saying, this is who I am right now, I'm only wearing the color black mom. And you're just like, okay, fine. You're gonna wear the color black and hopefully you know, you get through whatever you're going through and just accepting them as they go through these ups and downs of figuring out who they are. And just being that open door that they can come to whenever they feel uncomfortable. Um, you know, there may be um, looking for alternatives to having access to things that are advertised. You know, what alternatives can you come up with and saying, having a conversation with your child when something does come up, like, you know, a beer uh, advertisement coming on the TV and you saying, well, that's not really how it is. And then having that sort of conversation. And last but not least, I think this is obvious, but modeling behavior. Um, Amy, do you want to talk about this one specifically? Um, just when you're as a parent with your with your children, you do want to model um, appropriate behavior and positive behavior. Um, we do. Uh, my husband and I socially drink, but my kids will also tell you that they have never seen either one of us drink too much, and they're dying to. They want to see it one day, and it's like a joke in the family. Um, we show them that we don't need to drink or to have a good time or, you know, it's five o'clock somewhere. We, you know, we don't joke around about that, especially, you know, with my youngest who's now turning 18. I don't want her to have that thought that, you know, it's, it's just a joke and everybody's doing it. Um, just to show them how to be sensible that alcohol is a tool for adults, someone 21 and over who can do it sensibly. It's not about getting drunk. And that's the whole point. You know, you'll see teenagers to them, they drink to get drunk. And it's a constant conversation before my, kid, my other two went off to college that that's not the purpose of alcohol, to drink to get drunk. So it's, it's constantly having those conversations and not reading into the advertisements when they're showing that, oh, you need alcohol to have fun, to go to the beach and have a picnic on the beach, you have to have alcohol. You don't need to have that to have fun. And it's a constant battle that they think that just because there's this advertisement, um, a bonfire on the beach and everyone's drinking, that you need that to have the same fun. You don't need that. And, and we try to demonstrate it you know, by having different activities where we don't have alcohol. Sometimes we do, sometimes we're at a party when the kids were little and a lot of times you know, we didn't always drink. You know, you don't, it's not a need. I agree. Thank you for that. Um, and that is basically then our conversation uh, about uh, subtle advertising. But I always like to close with a quote because I feel like it's lasting. You can use it in a lot of different ways. I have two quotes here. The first one I'm going to read is, in our factory, we make, we make lipstick. In our advertising, we sell hope. Um, and this is by Peter Zerlinga. He, uh, I believe, is in terms of Mac, if I'm not mistaken. My apologies, I'm wrong. But basically, um, what he is saying here is that you are selling an idea of what people could be if they use that product. And I'd like to sort of take that on its head and say, you may sell hope, but that doesn't mean you have to call to that hope, that you have to answer that hope in any way in um, being um, anything in particular. Because if we raise our children uh, in this way, I think that... Um, it sort of negates the idea that you give hope to any advertisements to make money off of you. Um, and that sort of flips its head on this, that the child is both a hope and a promise for mankind, that if we raise our children in a way that they answer to that call of advertising, to question it, to second guess it, to look at it in a way that doesn't hurt them and doesn't, you know, doesn't cause them great pain, could be a real benefit to their development. Um, and they could be better for it in the long run. So any closing remarks? Um, no, I just like to tell my kids when we're talking about advertising or they see an advertisement, I always say, 
you know, sometimes look at the advertisement and say, hey, don't think I'm a fool that I'm going to fall for that. Don't be the fool that they're mm -hmm. trying to make you to be by falling for some of, some of the subtle, but also the blatant false advertising that we see out there. Yeah, I agree. Thanks so much, Amy, for being here. I really appreciate you taking your time. Uh, thank you for watching. Thank you for being here as well. And I look forward to seeing you all next week.